We are about ready to begin this morning. 
And so as you come in and head to your seats, uh, be sure to grab communion at the back of the auditorium. And as you find your seat, be sure to pick up a, communi a communication card, not a communion card, a communication card, and fill that out, and those will be picked up towards the end of service. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, man. And happy New Year's Eve. Man, what a year it has been. We are officially at the end of 2023. Today is the last day. At midnight tonight, 2023 will be history. As we look back and reflect on and think about all of our experiences this past year, there have been some highs, lows. There have been seasons of productivity. And there have been seasons of struggle. There's been growth. There's been life. There's been new life as well as loss. But in all of it, there's been a movement of the Lord's hand. A pointing, a guiding, sometimes a pushing and a pulling, sometimes a caring and a providing. And as we move into this next year, we really want to position ourselves to being a people, being a church, more open and aware of that movement. God has used 2023 in some very beautiful ways, centering our hearts and minds in a place that, that I really think we need to be, a place that he, he was moving us to be in, grasping the necessity of, of these times to go, to move in unity with a hunger and a desire to, to follow him, to serve him. To know him. And as we've carried and, and as we've been carried into that movement, we want to make sure that we are moving with him, that we are listening and responding to his call, to his guidance, to his leading, to his direction. Not working against him in our own belief about what we think is right, what we want to see happen, what we want to do, where we want to go but who he is, is calling us to be, who he needs us to be in this community to lead others to him. And to do that, we've got to acknowledge his sovereignty and position ourselves to receive and hear his message. What leads me to uh, my reading this morning in Psalm 95, one of my favorite psalms because in it the author penned uh, two songs that, that I've been singing for decades now in worship and praise about positioning and about acknowledgement. In verse 6, he writes, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people He watches over, the flock under His care. That's positioning. And then he begins the psalm with acknowledgement by saying, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving and sing songs of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds his hands, he holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land as well. Let us stand as we enter into this time of worship. Hallelujah, amen. Praises to Him we bring. Hallelujah, amen. With grateful heart and voice, before His throne rejoice. Praises His gracious choice. Alleluia, amen, alleluia, come worship Christ the King, alleluia, come worship Christ the King, come lift your hearts on high, alleluia, amen. Let praises fill the sky. Alleluia. Amen. 
He is our guide and friend. Our lives on him depend. His love will never end. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia. Come worship Christ the King. Alleluia. Come worship Christ the King. Praises to Christ belong. Alleluia. Amen. Life shall not end the song. Alleluia. Amen. On heaven's joyful shore, His glory will adore, singing forevermore. Alleluia, amen, alleluia, come worship Christ the King, alleluia, come worship Christ the King, alleluia, come worship Christ the King. Alleluia, come worship Christ the King. Lord, you are holy, Lord, you are powerful, Lord, you are wonderful to me. Lord, you are worthy, Lord, you are merciful, Lord, you are all I ever need. So I lift up your name and worship you on high, and I gladly proclaim the Savior of my life. Lord, you are mighty, Lord, you are majesty, Lord, you are everything to me. Lord, you are faithful, Lord, you are glorious, Lord, you are beautiful to me. Lord, you are loving, Lord, you are marvelous, Lord, you are all I ever need. So I lift up your name and worship you on high, and I gladly proclaim the Savior of my life. Lord, you are mighty. Lord, you are majesty. Lord, you are everything to me. So I lift up your name and worship you on high. And I gladly proclaim the Savior of my life. Lord, you are mighty. Lord, you are majesty. Lord, you are everything to me. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. As we come into your holy presence, and bow before your face. 
We worship you in holy reverence, surrounded by your endless grace. We are saved because of your mercy. We are ransomed because of your love. You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ. And to this we give our lives to see you glorified. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ. And to this we give our lives to see you glorified. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. Please be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every blessing that we have experienced during the past year. Thanks for all in our church family who have worked so hard to glorify your name. Those that teach, minister, perform acts of kindness, communicate, provide for those in need, serve on our staff, and serve behind the scenes. Thank you for all of our deacons who quietly serve our congregation. Thanks for giving Rachel to us and her many years of service to this church family and you. Thank you for the ones that filled in for her during her retirement. We ask that you continue to guide the shepherds as they put forth the effort to make decisions that lead us to glorify your name. I personally thank you for the shepherds with whom I serve. Thank you also for the 
blessings that we, we received from the lives of those we have lost during the past year. Be with the families of Conning Hill and Todd Maddox as they deal with their recent losses. As we begin the new year, help us to strengthen our faith and be joyful, happy, and optimistic about our church, family here, and life. Thank you for our strong congregation and your continued blessings. Help me as I progress in my work on myself and my frailties and the example I set. Thanks for your grace and forgiveness. In Christ's name, amen. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me, and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. As we prepare for our time of communion, as we've done a, a few times um, recently, I want to invite you just uh, to gather around with others. Um, and so you can take time if you want to get up and, and go to different parts of the auditorium, but gather around with others as we, before we share thoughts and, and share in this time. So just give you a moment just to gather with those around you. And if you have not gotten a, a communion cup and the bread, it is at the back of the auditorium. Or raise your hand, someone will gladly bring that to you. You know, one of the, the real blessings... Of, of this time is that we get to share in this together as a family. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11. This is what Paul wrote. 
On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. You know, one of the, the things that happens a lot at the end of a year is you reflect on the previous year. And what's really neat about our time that, that God has given us with communion is that reflection of what Christ has done. And so right now, I want you just for a moment just to go on and start thinking about this past year, but specifically on what Christ has done in your life this past year. In what ways you have seen God work this past year, in what ways you have seen his love. And I want to give you just a moment to share in that reflection together with those around you. So sharing in what you have seen Christ do in your life, how you've seen God work, and in what ways you've seen his love. Take a few moments to share those together. You know what I, what I love, and, and you can have a seat if you want to where you are. You can stand, you can, you can do it, whatever. But what I love is as you hear the words just flowing out is the praise to God for the things that he's done, for the ways that he loves us. You know, it's, it's really interesting. Communion really is, in so many ways, so similar to, to our New Year's, right? There is a reflection that normally takes place. Reflection is what we do every Sunday of reflecting on what Christ did, his sacrifice and his death. But there's also an anticipation, an anticipation for the new year, for renewal, that's where I love Luke 22. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering began. You know, that phrase, and I believe I've talked about it before up here, but that phrase, I have been very eager, is really interesting. Because we know with what Christ went through that it was not something that he just wanted to endure. I mean, he asked for, the, for it to be passed over him. That if it was the Lord's will, that he wouldn't have to go through with this. But he was willing. Because he loves us. And he wanted us 
to be with him. And so his eagerness of this meal in so many ways, I, I do think there's much significance to his eagerness with the disciples right there, but I also think it was for each of us. That anticipation that, that as we would gather, knowing that as we would gather even this very Sunday morning, that all around the world, Christians would be gathering around the table, reflecting on his death, but in eager anticipation for his return. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. And he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Let's pray. Father, you are so good. And just the very gift of what you've given us of these moments are so good. But ultimately the gift of your son. Father, it's so hard to even begin to wrap our minds around a love like that. A love that you have for us. We are so broken, so imperfect, so undeserving. But you love us. Father, I pray that just as we center our minds and we focus our minds around the bread and the cup in remembrance of our Savior. Father, we pray that we do it in a way that is reverent and honoring to you. Father, thank you for family, for this family, that we get to share in this together. Father, thank you for the sacrifice. We put him on the cross. And you did, you went through it all for us. Father, let us never forget that. Let us not only think about these things and what you have done in this past year, what you're going to do in this year in the anticipation of, of all of it, Father, let us dwell on all of those things daily with an eager longing for any time that we are together, for an eager longing to see you constantly, Let our lives just overflow with a love for you. A love that is so amazing, so perfect. And Father, just as we take this bread, and as we take this cup, let you be praised. Let you be remembered. Let you be celebrated. And may you come. May you come soon. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
we don't purposefully do a lot of up and downing from our seating to our standing. But it does tend to make our singing better. So if you would like, please feel free to stand as we continue our worship. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you say. I believe there are scars in your hands. That your goodness is good without end, and you'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation who knows me by name, the Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always, always. I believe you will come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. In your presence I know there is power, power to save. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation who knows me by name, the Lord is faithful. Yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always, always. You are, you are, you always will be God. You are. You are, you always will be God. You always will be God. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation who knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful, Yesterday, now, and always. Blessed be your name, in the land that is plentiful, for your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk in the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. 
Let me bless you, pour out I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause. Maintain the honor of his word, the glory of his cross. Jesus, my God, I know his name. His name is all my trust. Nor will he put my soul to shame, nor let my hope be lost. Firm as his throne, his promise stands, and he can well secure what I've committed to his hands till the decisive hour. Then will he own my worthless name before his Father's face. And in the new Jerusalem, a point for me, a place. Please be seated. Today's scripture reading is from Acts 26, verses 12 through 23. And I'll be reading the NIV version. This is Paul's defense before King Agrippa. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the visions from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all of Judea. And then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and, as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles.
as we get started this morning, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and I'm going to want to see some hands here. Uh, I want to know how many of you were uh, marched in the band. Let me see some hands. Got a bunch of band folks here. Okay, good. That's, that's good to see. Good to see. I was in the high school band. I uh, marched at uh, McGavick, Levi. See, so you recognize the MC there? See, on there? Got the logo and everything right? Okay. Uh, now, I, I want to kind of expand this out a little bit, though. Okay, so how many of you were in chorus? Let me see hands up. Ah, some, some different hands. Yeah, some other chorus folks. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is not me in chorus. This is my daughter, Rebecca. She was uh, early 2000s at Lipscomb, and she was, uh, she was in the chorus. Okay. Now, while we're, while we're kind of doing this, let's kind of round out our musical knowledge here just a little bit, a little bit more broadly. How many of you were in the orchestra? Okay, let me see some hands. Maybe, okay, see maybe some, some folks here. And, and yes, this is another one of my grandchildren here. This is Lucas, and this was the Hume Fogg uh, band. He was uh, a, a flute player, okay, so... Uh, that was taken at one of his concerts. Okay, final, final run of these, and then we're going to have everybody that's in any of these categories raise your hand. But I want to know if you ever took music lessons. Okay, so if you, you know, played guitar or keyboard or anything else like that, okay? So, you know, you, you learned along, and, and yes, this is an old picture of my granddaughter when she got her keyboard, so I was looking around for that. Okay, so... If you are in any of those categories that we just described, raise your hand. Man, we've got to do something with our youth group, Matt. I mean, one musician, well, one and a half, okay, all right. Now, you can put your hands down, and I'll tell you why we started off with that, okay? We started off with that for a very simple reason. I had this great idea uh, that I wanted to put together our our lesson today as a crescendo. And I got to thinking, how much of an explanation do I need to have about the term crescendo? And so now I'm going to ask kind of a follow-up question for anybody not named Phil Sanders. Can you define crescendo? Would somebody define? Yes. You start low, and you get loud. Exactly. That's ex that's exa that's perfect description. And, and you see it in music in the two ways that I have up here on the screen. Sometimes it's a little wedge that gets further apart. Sometimes it's the word crescendo. Sometimes it's an abbreviation of the word crescendo. Okay. And, and I'll just tell you, I remember when I learned what a crescendo was. Song 425 in our book. Uh, you're not going to go there. I didn't ask Phil to lead it, okay? Master the Tempest is Raging, also known as Peace Be Still. It's got the longest chorus of any song that I think is ever in our books, okay? Uh, but it's cool, and, and I remember the first time I heard it, you know? It's got that little phrase that starts out, Peace, be still. And, and it's, it's marked, again, this is a little bit of, of, you know, musical notation here with two Ps. And that means, my, my band director used to say, that's like a rat licking ice. Quiet, peace, be still. And then the chorus gets going and we get singing and you do exactly what you described. You get a little bit louder and louder, and finally it gets down to where it says he's the master of ocean and earth and sky. Now, look, I didn't make that up. I mean, it's double F. That's very loud. And so there's a crescendo that goes along through there, okay? You got the idea? This week's lesson is going to be a crescendo. We've been doing this study, It's Time, 
all the way through 2023. We broke it into three different subsections, and today we finished the third of those subsections. My intention is, the way I oriented and organized the characters, is that we will end on a crescendo. And if you're not musically oriented and you're thinking about it like, what? Okay, I'm still not sure what this is. It's an exclamation point. Okay? Shift it to English. Maybe that'll help you understand it a little bit. It's an exclamation point. Now, be turning your Bible, be turning your device over to Acts chapter 6. By the way, that's not what <laughs> Tim read, but that's okay because we've got to get some background in place before we get to what Tim read. And as you're turning your device or your Bible over to that particular area, allow me to kind of unfold here a little bit and, and also kind of remind you, we're not ready to announce it yet, but we've got the next theme for 2024 picked out, and Matt and Greg and I are kind of getting that all together, and we'll be sharing that with you next Sunday, okay? So that'll give you some idea for that. Now, uh, Paul who earlier is known as Saul, writes a significant part of the New Testament. And in his epistles, in the letters that he writes, he gives us some background about himself. In Philippians, he talks about how he is a Jew. He's raised in a Jewish family. He is one uh, in a part of one of the parties or sects of the Jews known as the Pharisees, and they're very strict, they're very conservative, and, and he is advancing as a student in Judaism, and, and that means that he needs to, to leave the area where he is in Asia Minor, around the city of Tarsus, and, and he needs to go to the heart of, of Judaism, which is in Jerusalem, and, and he does, and he arranges to study with a very well-known rabbi by the name of Gamaliel. We know from secular records that Gamaliel was one of the leaders of the Jews in the first part of the first century. He was a leader in the Sanhedrin. He had a very influential role there. And Saul is going to be his disciple. He's going to study with him. And, and that means a couple of things. It means that he's probably in a minority. He, he can read and write. And in the first century, that's probably only about 15% of the population. In addition to that, he is, because he's a rabbi, he's going to have a, uh, a job. He's going to have a vocation. And, and he chooses to be a tent maker. And that's something that he will fall back on from time to time. And so we have this kind of picture of him as a person, quite frankly, that if we were to pick somebody who would convert to Christianity, he would be pretty far down the list. But as we continue to observe his history and events, and this does get us now into Acts chapter 6, it becomes even more incomprehensible that he would convert to Christianity. Because, as I said, in Acts chapter 6, we encounter a young man by the name of Stephen. And, and Stephen is incredibly talented as not just a physical speaker, but as someone who is able to argue the claims that Jesus is the Messiah. And he's being very successful at that. Probably, we would say today, too successful and it gains the attention of the Jewish leadership, that very Sanhedrin that we talked about, that were ruling the Jews. And so as a result of that, Stephen is brought in before them, and we turn the page now to chapter 7, and almost that entire chapter is Stephen's speech before that Sanhedrin group. And as those events reach a crescendo... I'm going to use that term a couple of times. As those people are now confronted by what Stephen is saying, they become enraged and they take him outside the city and they kill him by throwing rocks and stones at him. And Stephen dies as the first 
Christian martyr. Now, in that context of chapter 7, we now turn the page, and the first thing that we read in Acts chapter 8 is an observation about Saul. Saul approved of their killing him. And the events intensify when we get down to verse 3. We find out that this Saul is going to different synagogues in the area around Jerusalem. He's going even eventually house to house, and he is arresting Christians, having them put in jail, and maybe even having some of them put to death. Now, there are a series of side stories that relate to some of what happens as everybody kind of gets scattered around in Acts chapter 8. But we get back to Acts chapter 9 as we're going along, and Saul has had success here in Jerusalem, but he realizes, and that was some of what happened in the latter part of chapter 8, that some of these Christians, if they've started arresting them, they're scattering around. They're leaving town. And so he decides he's going to follow some, and we kind of have to read a little bit between the lines here that he must know that there are some Christians who've left and gone up to Damascus, and so he gets letters from the priest and the authorities there that will allow him to go into this other province, into this other area, to the city of Damascus, and continue his persecution of Christians there. At least that is how it is supposed to go. But Acts chapter 9 is the first of three narratives of these events that share really the same key items. Not far from the city of Damascus, Saul is confronted with a great light. And and he hears a voice, the voice of Jesus that communicates him, and tells him to go into the city. And by the way, he is unable to see. He is blind. And so he goes into the city of Damascus, wondering what he should do. And we know that for a period of about three days, he engages in a complete fast. He doesn't have anything to eat. He also doesn't have anything to drink. And it's during that time that Jesus appears to another individual, a guy by the name of Ananias. Ananias is a Christian, and he tells, Jesus tells Ananias that he wants him to go to see Saul, that Saul is in the house of Judas. Now, Ananias is going to do what Jesus requests, but he's a little bit hesitant to accept that call. And that reminds us of some of these categories that we have been developing since September of individuals who, yes, are called by God, uh, but they are hesitant to really embrace that. And so we think of the names of Gideon and Moses and Zechariah. Well, Ananias gets around to it. He finally goes to Saul and, and, and tells him that he is to be a divine witness. And Saul obeys. If Ananias is a model of those who question, Saul fits into the category of Mary and the shepherds and and individuals like Isaiah and Matthew who, when called by God, immediately responds. And and that's not only true of his being baptized. Uh, As we were reading in the text for this morning, an older and wiser individual, now going by the name Paul, says, I was not disobedient to the vision. Paul was not disobedient. He received this call, and then he enthusiastically spends the rest of his life living it out. When Jesus is confronted by Jesus, when Saul is confronted by Jesus, and the particulars of that call are given to him by Ananias. He models that response. His life is going to be oriented about giving messages to others, giving others their call. And as he tells Agrippa, they are to repent 
and to turn to God, demonstrating the reality of their repentance by their actions. And I am convinced that Paul is a crescendo. He is a crescendo. If we think back in this series we've been doing sep since September, we have examined the lives of 16 characters. We have walked beside them as God moved in their lives or those around them, and we have seen their response to the Lord. We have seen a great variety in the calls that God provides to them the things that he asks them to do, as well as the manner in which they are called. But, but here's what's key. They have a shared component, a shared component. And that is that God desires that everyone, everyone respond to him. Now, Saul is not somebody we would anticipate that would respond to that. In fact, he was an enemy of God, but God wanted him to be saved. Matthew, we studied him. He was a tax collector who had become wealthy at the expense of his countrymen, but God wanted him to be saved. Jesus wanted him to be numbered among his disciples, and he called Matthew, and Matthew responded to that call. Samson would be someone we would recognize and call a, a womanizer. He was someone with an unbelievably violent uh, anger and, and temper that many times was out of control. But God wanted to use Samson in some special ways, and so God called him. Now, if we had more time in this series, if you had a little bit more patience, then we could do a study of people who were called by God but did not respond. And if I were putting together that sermon series, I probably would start with Abel, okay? Because, because here is the guy who was killed by his brother Cain, all right? And you remember God came to Cain and said, hey, hey, you need to be careful here. But, but as he was doing that, he didn't listen. And so Cain kills his brother Abel. And, and probably we would spend some time visiting in the story of Esther with a character by the name of Haman. Haman devises a plot, a genocide of the Jews. He's going to try to destroy them all. And, and that's not what God wanted to do. He wanted him to make better choices, but he didn't because he couldn't get past his own pride. Jezebel marries Ahab, and, and I'm convinced that it is God's desire that Ahab influence this young woman, Jezebel, to be able to be converted and become a follower of God and go back to her people, the Phoenicians, and transform that unbelievable culture. But it doesn't work that way. Instead, Jezebel, in essence, converts her husband, Ahab, and he becomes more and more rebellious against God and she leads him further astray. Just, just one more, and I don't want you to get lost too much here in the details. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Herodias, and, and Herodias is married to two of the sons of Herod the Great. First to Herod the Second, and, and then she divorces or gets rid of him and marries Antipas. And that marriage to Antipas isn't appropriate, and so John the baptizer calls her out on it. Well, you call out Herodias, and she's married to these kings, and she comes back at you. And, and so she sets up so that her daughter from the first uh, of Herod's kids, a, a woman by the name of Salome, she dances before her stepfather and is able to secure the execution of John the baptizer. That's not what God had wanted for Herodias. 
Paul is modeling a lifestyle here uh, of encouraging people to properly respond to God. And, and against all of those or any of those negative models, okay? In, in fact, just a few verses later in the reading that Tim shared with us, Festus interrupts Paul's story of the, the, the discussion there and, and, and as he's talking about his conversion and his call to Christ, there is a back and forth between Festus and Agrippa. And, and it culminates in the latter asking if Paul is trying to persuade him to become a Christian. And here's what Paul says in verse 29. Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. And I will tell you this morning exactly the same thing. Whether this is your first visit to Riverwood or your 500th, okay, whether you grew up in a family that took you to church and taught you about Jesus and the things that you needed to do to, to follow after God, or you have been living a life as an agnostic or an atheist, a pagan, whatever word you want to do, and, and maybe you're just having a moment of curiosity, you want to know a little bit more about God and salvation, okay? God's desire for you is the same. God's desire for you and for me and for every single person, not only here but in the neighborhoods around us, is the same. And that is that we would turn to him and repent. And, and just so you know, it's not going to be a secret, okay? We're going to ask you to, in your mind, envision and to make a response to the call of God today. We're not going to ask you to do anything uh, that wasn't asked of the Apostle Paul. He was told to turn to God. He was told to be baptized. He was told he would be forgiven. He was told that he would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That isn't unusual. It's not controversial. It's not complicated. It's basically what God has been saying to people for over 4,000 years of recorded biblical history. God wants us to turn back to him. But that's not the end of the story for Paul, and it's not really the end of the story for us as well. You see, Jesus calls him to mission. We're told, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Can you hear the crescendo there? There are the same actions... But Paul is, shared, is, is given this mission, this call, of not only doing that himself, but then sharing that into the lives of others. And we need to understand that that's given to us as well. In all four of the Gospels, there is a version of what we call the Great Commission. And if you distill it down... It is, it is a charge that all of us who are forgiven, all of us who were saved by God, would share what has happened to us in the lives of those around us. And now, it's more generic. It's not as specific as it was here given to Paul and, and what he received. But it is critical, critical that we take our role and that we we take up that responsibility and that we do so seriously. Well, today is New Year's Eve. And Larry mentioned that in his prayer. Greg mentioned that in his comments. You can know that that's the case because I've got on my one New Year's tie. I've got the fat baby tie on, you know, the New Year's Eve tie, etc., 
And New Year's Eve, as has already been alluded to, is a time that we traditionally reflect upon the past and we will plan for the future. It's a time to look back and a time to look forward. I, I spent some time professionally this past week setting up my goals and objectives for 2024. I was thinking about some of the successes that I had had last year as a financial advisor and planner and looking toward doing that as we move forward. And as I was doing all of that, I set some goals. I, I thought about the number of new clients that I want to have in 2024 and, and assets under management and the, and the like. And, and probably there are a number of you in your role and your work, you had to do some of the same types of things. Many will use this season of the year to set some goals or some resolutions. For, for some of you, it, it might be that you want to eat in a more healthy way. For some of you, it may be that you want to lose some weight. I, I know that when I get back in this next week at the Y in my spin class, there'll be a lot of new faces, folks who decided, hey, I've got to exercise more. And so they're going to be thinking about that as well. And the Y will be full for at least the next couple of months or so. This morning, I would encourage you to take a spiritual inventory. Have you responded to God's call for your life? Have you responded to his call to repent and to turn to God and to demonstrate that repentance by your actions? If not, I, I want you to know that would be absolutely the best way to end 2023. That would be the pure, true crescendo. And I want you to understand that, that, you know, if you need to discuss that in more detail, if you have some questions, one of our shepherds is going to be at the, at the back, and, and they'll be there to, to speak with you privately, to answer questions that you might have about responding to God's call. But it's also possible that as you are making that personal inventory that you would realize that there are changes you need to make in 2024, actions that frankly you can't achieve on your own. And what you need are the prayers of brothers and sisters in Christ on your behalf uh, that would come alongside you and would support you and encourage you and hold you accountable. If we can do that this morning, if you need to speak with one of our shepherds, make your way to the front at this time as we stand and sing. Have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know, my Jesus, do you know, my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will abide till the end? Where is your heart, O pilgrim? What does your light reveal? Who hears your call for comfort when naught but sorrow you feel? Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will abide till the end? Who knows your disappointments? Who hears each time you cry? Who understands your heartaches? 
who dries the tears from your eyes. Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard he loves you? and that he will abide till the end. Please be seated. This morning, our sister Marianne comes and uh, she uh, uh, expresses a desire to do more for God in 2024. And she realizes that if she's going to do that successfully, she has uh, uh, got to address some things in her life. And uh, she says that she can be too critical, she can uh, uh, be. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, negative toward others, and even though she's trying to push them in the right direction, she can sometimes create problems with that. And she realizes some of the relational difficulties that that creates, and she wants to do better in overcoming that. She wants to do better as God's, uh, a God's child, God's disciple, to be the type of person who can uh, motivate and move others, but at the same time, uh, be, be more effective in, in showing that love and kindness uh, to them. And so uh, we want to uh, go on, uh, on her behalf this morning, and I'm going to ask one of our shepherds, Tim Hinton, to uh, come and to uh, lead us in a word of prayer on uh, Mary Ann's behalf. Right. I'll give us a minute here, actually. There are some folks coming forward. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that Marianne had the courage to come forward today and ask for special prayers. God, we ask that you please be with her, help her attitude to align with, with the way that you would like, help her to be an encourager, help her to be willing to reach out to people. God, she's an example today to, to many of us that struggle with the same things, and, and I ask that you please be with each of us and help us to do the same. Help us to be encouragers and help us to reach out to the folks around us. Help us to be a, a positive influence on the people that we have day-to-day -day contact with. Help us to be more forgiving. Help us to be more loving. Help us to be examples of, of Christ. God, we know that, that our attitudes can greatly influence the people around us. We can plant seeds. We can become better disciples if, if we align with your will and if, if we do the things that you ask of us. God, we ask that you please be with each of us that are here today. Help us to be closer to each other. Help us to 
lift each other up when, when people are struggling or when they're hurting. God, help us most of all to always look to you for our guidance and for our, our advice and for the way that we should be living our life. God, we ask that you please be with each of us throughout the rest of this day. Help us to be safe. Help us to close out this year on a strong note and start the new year in a great way. God, continue to bless this church. We love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Mary Ann, thank you for your courage and your heart. And may that be a, a prayer uh, for each of us, a reflection of, of each of our lives and, and the ways that we're living. Mary, we love you. We, uh, we have several families who are going through some really uh, difficult times, and uh, we want to extend the love and sympathy uh, to the family of Todd Maddox. Uh, funeral services were conducted yesterday here at, at the building, uh, but please remember all the Maddox family uh, in your prayers, and, and there are several. Uh, Janet, we're praying for you, and, and I know Bob and, and Carol, and, and just so many who were, were close to him, so uh, be praying for, for all of their family. And we also uh, want to extend the love and sympathy uh, to the family of Connie Hill. And uh, services um, are incomplete at this time, but they will be at Mount Olive on Lebanon Road, and we'll get that information out um, as soon as as soon as we have it, as soon as possible. Uh, but be praying for Misty and and for Vicky and for Cindy and just all of the all of their family as well, just a, as they go through that. And what a what a wonderful woman uh, she was, and an example I know to to so many of us. And I just want to share just a, a letter that the Binkley family wrote. Uh, Dear Riverwood Congregation, our family wishes to thank you for, the many, for your many expressions of support and comfort during Rick's long illness and his passing. Rick loved Riverwood. Over the years of his service here, he had opportunities and offers to serve other congregations, but he was always drawn back to the ties that bound him to the Inglewood community and his family at Riverwood. You were his people. You owned his heart. Thank you so much for the beautiful flowers, the delicious and abundant food, and the many kind expressions of care and comfort that you offered at his memorial service. Please continue to remember our family in prayers as we learn to navigate the world without our beloved husband, father, and grandfather. And please remember the love that he had for each of you. It was genuine and everlasting. Sincerely, Debbie, Emily, Daniel, John, Charlotte, and Sam. And so please Continue to remember the Binkley family uh, as well. And be praying for each other. And, and may you have a, a happy new year. A reminder, no classes uh, this morning. And Rod has uh, something to share. Pack your cards to the, to the side. Get a signal from the back. <coughs> On behalf of uh, Inner City Ministries, I would l like to thank uh, you all for all your generous givings uh, to help them replenish their pantry. You donated two trunk loads full of the many items and various items they had requested in less than three weeks, which is pretty amazing. This type of donation allows them to reach out to many families that do not have enough basic food and unnecessary items, especially at this time of the year. Thank you again. This is just another example of what a giving and compassionate church family you are. Thank you. And I guess we're dismissed to fellowship and class. Uh, no class. No class today. Fellowship only.